John Steinbeck called them ambassadors from another time. They are the tallest trees in the world. They grow nowhere other than here. You get that humility of being among these incredible giants that have been around for millions of years. I felt so full of gratitude. I just feel a whole lot healthier. It's a privilege to be out it's here. It's powerful. It just feels really alive it was just being so here. Giant. It's extremely like humbling. It humbles you. Man, this right here is like the closest you can get to like magic. The Redwood Forest is unique around the world. And when we were founded 101 years ago now, it was at a time when the rate of harvest of the redwood forest was extraordinary. Say the Redwoods League learned about a remnant stand of old growth that was hidden. For years, there were whispers of a hidden grove nestled in the hills above California's Sonoma coast. A mythical place where you could walk among giants the stuff of legend until now. It, it blew my mind when we got this under contract because I had heard that it was old growth and I've heard that term thrown around very loosely. This is 700 acres of old growth redwood. There is nothing else like this that's still unprotected. Some of the redwoods in this forest have been around since before California was a state, before the fall of the Roman Empire, and they're still growing. The redwood forest is 600, 700 year old trees. But dappled in that forest, there are three or four monsters that are over 1,500 years old. There's one tree out there that is 1,647 years old. It's the oldest coast redwood tree south of Mendocino County. And we didn't even know it was there. Say the Redwoods League posted on Facebook I started reading up on it, and I was like, wow, that'd be awesome. I sent an email to Sam. I got an email from Teresa a little while after we'd announced the purchase. In that email, I asked, you know, I'm aware of this reserve that you guys are about to introduce to the public. Give it to me. Let me do it with a group of people from underrepresented communities. And he said, let's talk about it. Go to social media, pull up any brand. What images do you see? More than likely, they are not people that look like me. That's the why. I think all too often, people forget that communities of color have always been in the outdoors. But through generations, some of us have been removed. These are people that work on these issues day in and day out, but you don't see us. We're in the background having these conversations. We're not out front, and that's the problem. Let me welcome you all here. My name's Sam Hodder, and we are standing on uh, the ancestral territory of the Kashaya Band of the Pomo. Teresa's assembled a group of community leaders, outdoor advocates. You have people from various underrepresented communities that can speak heavily to these issues, sharing why it's important that they are represented. It's not just one group of people that are using these public spaces. There's so many ways that the forest serves different populations of people, and we want to incorporate that in what we do going forward. This is really the first opportunity to welcome a community into this property. We recognize that we have a lot to learn, and today is a big part of that. What an amazing opportunity to learn from one another about how to deliver that public value in a new day. 
When the white man first came to North America, a great part of the continent was clothed in majestic forests. If we go to the mid-1840s, there were 2.2 million acres of old-growth coast redwood forest that really defined California's coastline. Trees flourished in countless numbers. And all of a sudden, the gold rush. The loggers slashed into the virgin forests with little or no thought for the future. As San Francisco and other Bay Area cities started to grow, the population numbers were exploding. And all in his day's work, over goes the top of this tree. From small little communities sprung a full-fledged city in a matter of a decade. Then they begin their cutting. And it was a city built entirely out of redwood. Cutting their way into trees that may be as old as our civilization. For the redwood trees of California are probably the oldest of living things. The old growth coast redwood, we came really close to losing altogether. It was just so cool being in the woods with a bunch of people of color. <laughs> That's just magical. I just really think we just need to acknowledge that, you know, folks of color have always been a part of the conservation movement. I have been pioneering as a person of color in the outdoors since 1996. And I still get some under the breath remarks or people will say something really racially aggressive and offensive. The more we show that we're out here and that we've always been out here, um, the easier that I certainly hope that it'll be for folks coming after. Wow. Yeah, that's from the, the what she said, owl. great horned owl that lives up there. Wow. That's cool. There's a big oh, one. You, there's, so you see that one right there? Yeah. The oh, buzz. boy. I would say that this is a forest built on resilience, that this is a forest of consistent regeneration. And I think there's a lot of hope in that. It's just a reminder that we are standing together, holding each other up, kind of like these trees are. Yeah, this is a big old bathroom this one, right? <laughs> This, see, this is starting. I can't even touch both sides of this. <laughs> the land is like so ingrained into our identity. And when we're talking about conservation, often it's been approached from like, let's remove people, let's remove indigenous people. And that disconnect, I feel like is a piece of how we lose our identity. I think that's a big shift we need to make as a whole community. How can we protect this place with people. Well. That was just such a cool feeling. <laughs> yeah, to be like, <laughs> the service that our parks are providing, Redwoods and beyond, are fundamental to a healthy society and um, livable communities. Reimagining how we welcome a diverse public is fundamental to that to be not only uh, invited in, but to be welcomed in. It's putting the message out there that this space is your space. For sure, it felt really safe. It gave me a lot of hope, because there's people trying to do things differently. It feels that I'm seen and I'm valued. It's an honor and also like, why doesn't this happen more? <laughs> there was just a lot of honesty and open conversation. It really is a step in reconnecting folks to their roots. A big piece of what I feel like is missing, especially in my community. I'm still making me smile inside. It can, for many people, seem like a box checking exercise where we're just saying, we talked to these people, great, we did it, let's go back to what we always do. This is going to impact how I do my job. Without having proper equity in spaces, it's going to continue to reinforce systematic racism. So re-including these voices and reclaiming that space for ourselves is like essentially like the way to move forward. We need future leaders that represent the communities that we look to. So that we can all be the stakeholder to make sure this place is going to last. You have this awesomeness coming in from so many different places. If that can happen, then that can change everything on a systematic level. So I think it's important that people see us they see beyond the lens they've always looked through when they see someone that cares about the ocean, the mountains, the forest. And they see me, they see Jose, they see Amanda. It's time for us to reimagine the role that our parks play in a very different California. We want to be a partner in that. We all exist on the same planet 
and as a collective, we can all do this together.